you have your finger at the hilt, it helps. Because if you hear a lot of talk in European swordsmanship about a hammer grip, okay, well, um, that's the most profoundly stupid way to describe how to hold a sword probably imaginable, because no one eats a steak with a hammer, okay? If you look at how you finger the grip of the sword, you can choke up on it. If you just relax your hand, the sword and arm make about a, what's that, about a 125 degree angle. And really that's what you're looking for here, okay? So you don't want to choke up on the sword. When you're in this guard, you'll notice how Rob's point is angled up, but is constantly inclining away from him. Okay. It's pointing towards the opponent. So you don't want to break the wrist and drop it, but you do want it to have this natural angle. And that's so that when you cut, you'll have this facilitation of the day blade of the sword. Okay. So if you're not using a sword with a um, bigger ring, For is when you hold the sword, there's a little mouth that opens between the rear cross and your finger. Okay, so my index finger is right up underneath the guard, but you just relax and let the small fingers of the hand hold the weight of the sword. Okay. The other thing is make sure that when you're holding it, the hilt is behind this big fat muscle of the thumb. So that, that cross, you'll notice, is actually angled just to the outside of my forearm. Okay? It just keeps the edge aligned while you cut. Okay? Right. I keep your posture, simply raise the chin. What that'll do is straighten the back. Okay? Also, tuck the hips right under our torso. Okay? So that everybody just raise their chin slightly. So want to be looking forward at your opponent, but have that chin raised. So we're slowly forming this guard called Coda Longa Estreta, right? So the long, narrow tail. Everything held on this right side is what Vigiani refers to as the offensive guards. Okay? And those offensive guards, the other masters call Coda Longa. Okay? Alright, so you notice the positioning of my rear foot. So why is my rear foot raised like this? It's because I'm taking my left hip and I'm pushing it forward. Okay, Greg, can I borrow you? Yep. And can you grab that for mm -hmm. So you'll notice Cota Longa is closing off my outside line. I'm defending my outside line. So that's where I want to be directing my energy. So I'm going to put my sword down for a moment. Now to form that guard without the sword, and Greg goes ahead and pushes, he has a lot of leverage on me. Because the way I position my body, I'm directing my force this way. Okay? Conversely, if I were to form the opposite guard of Cota Longa Estereta, Porte di Ferro Estereta, to the opposite line, I'm now directing my energy this way. Notice the positioning of my hips. Okay? My right hip is now coming forward and directing my energy into my opponent's weapon. Okay? So let's have everybody from Cota Longa Estereta take that right hip now and rotate it forward and watch what happens to the rear foot. Turn out and back. Good. Okay. Have, have everybody come to Cota Longa. Good. And Cota Longa, drive that left hip forward. Okay. Raise the chin. Keep the back straight. Bring the hand to the inside. Keeping everything in the straight line. Do not bend the wrist. Good. And that right hip comes forward. Good. All right. Hold it. So Manchelino tells us the entirety of the fight rests in raising and lowering of the guards, okay? So if we simply make a motion from Cota Longa Estreta to Porto di Ferro Estreta, I am making an action between those two moments of rest, okay? Which in fancy we call a tempo, okay? Those tempi are cuts. So you can see as I make a mezza mendrito from Cota Longa Estreta to Porto di Ferro Estreta, I can do the same thing back the opposite direction. So make a mezzo reverso, okay? Half cut simply means that my point of my sword is still directed at my point. My point is in presence, as we say. Okay, so let's do this a few times. So from Cota Longa Estreta, bring the hand over, rotate those hips, and in. 
Okay? So not only am I creating opposition to the side that I'm moving, I'm powering my cut with my body. Okay? Now, if Greg and I are fencing doing a friendly bout, I can do this, right? Oh, look, I got Greg. Right? It's not going to do anything with the real sword. If I want to cut Greg, I'm going to use my entire body to do it. Okay? No matter how much I spend in the gym powering, pumping up my arm, it's not going to be as powerful as my core. Okay? So I want to use the most powerful part of my body to power these guts. Okay? Mm -hmm. So students, yeah, sorry. The important thing to remember is that even with the power pants, Rob and I are woefully underdressed for 16th century gentlemen. This doublet should be padded and stuffed. Okay? We should be wearing several layers of linen underneath us. So a cut, even when we're just in civilian clothing, unless it's across my face, needs to have power. Okay? It isn't a slice, it's a cut. That's something important to understand. Everything in this art, this is still a military art, everything in this art is meant to develop powerful blows. Okay? So that's something I want you to keep in mind. Even these little half cuts that we're going to look at right now should have full commitment of the body. Plus, it'll take a lot of stress out of the arm, okay? So we'll be able to do this for the next six hours without tiring out our arm, right? Because we're using our entire body to do this. All right, so let's keep going. So as I mentioned, the rear foot is acting like a rudder to direct the position of my body. The front foot acts as my power delivery um, point of reference. So wherever my blow is going, that's where my right foot is pointing. So usually I'm attacking the person in front of me, which is at this moment, right? So that's where my right foot is being directed, okay? Towards the point at which I'm delivering my energy, okay? So rear foot acting as a rudder, right foot directing the energy, okay? All right, so now let's do the converse action of this. So we started in Kota Longo, we made a Jesus Slaw Grotto, okay? Into Portia Pura Larga. Now let's start in Porta di Ferri Strata, okay? We're going to make a verso stramazzone, as Dal Gautier calls it, the earlier masters referred to it as a molinetta, which is the same action except for it's breaking to the outside now. Okay? Good. And we're making a reverso squalorato into coda longa e larga. So let me show that. Face this way. So Porta di Ferri Strata, right? My right hip is forward. I'm closing off that inside line. My body is almost in full profile. Make a verso squalombrato, I'm sorry, a verso stramazzone, and make a reverso squalombrato, the coda longa larga. See the curve in the spine here? Okay. So I'm bringing those shoulders back and the butt tucked in. That's the position you want to look at. Okay, so just follow that. There's a sharp curve to the low back, extended leg, okay? Your calf should feel tight and coiled like a spring, okay? I don't mean so tight that you're going to give yourself a calf up. Cramp, okay, but it's just it should be this feeling of being coiled and ready to strike up and out of this position, okay. So you got to think, right, a haughty Italian when you do this, okay. So really emphasize that curve in the small of the back. Good. Come back to forward to the right hip forward. Good. Right to the outside. Okay, here we need to bend the elbow ever so slightly because our wrist does not want to bend this direction, right? So, cut off the right ear. We're making a reverso stramazzone and a reverso squalombrato. The coda longa e larga. And right back to the ferris strata. Okay? Molinetto or reverso stramazzone and a full cut down to coda longa e larga. Is that cuts can either be concordant or discordant. Okay. Cuts from my right, the natural way to step is with my right foot. Okay? So you can imagine if I'm a left foot forward guard, and let's say I come to Alta, watch the ceiling, and I make a Drito Squalombrato, the natural way to step with my foot is to pass with my right foot. Okay? So we can say that all concordant cuts are with the foot from whence the cut originates. So Mandriti originated from my right, so I step with my right. Reverso originate with my left, so I step with my left. Okay? By stepping with that foot, it naturally drives that hip forward, so we call it concordant. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. All right, so let's just practice that a few times. So 
So we're going to, let's say, left foot forward, coda longa seta, sometimes called coda longa e alta. Okay? We're going to make a dritto um, trampasone. <laughs> Sorry. And we're going to pass with that right foot, cutting right down to coda longa larga. Good. And pass back. Coda longa e alta, or coda longa seta, left foot forward. Drito Shamitsone and pass. Deported fairly. I'm sorry, deported yeah. fairly. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, it's a good thing. Okay. <laughs> when you see him while he's standing in guard, his head is up, his chin is looking over his shoulder, right? And his shoulder, his hip, his knee, and his toe are all in alignment, okay? That is what defines Portia Fairly Larga, okay? It's, it's Brilliant, you're doing a great job with it. Okay, that alignment of the joints is what you're looking for. Okay, so much in the same way when we come to the other larga guard, right? I have, I'm looking straight out, and all of these joints are in alignment. Okay, same thing when we look at strata, strata, okay? So when you're in Porta de Ferro, you are looking over your right shoulder. When you are in larga, coda longa. And longa, yeah, thank you, coda longa, any of its permutations, you have brought the left shoulder forward, and you're looking straight out with the sword sitting back to the right. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? The more you think about where your body is, the easier this will be, because everything is defined through the guardia. Okay? The guardia are the, are the benchmarks of the art. Okay? I'll do it. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's keep working this. So left foot forward or non-dominant foot forward for you. Yeah, left Okay. Coda longa. Maybe dritto shamatsone and a full mandrito. I'm going to explain it like this. Anytime we cut from our right, it is powered with our right hip. Anytime we cut from the left, it is powered with our left hip. Both independent of which foot is forward or which foot I'm stepping away. Okay. So what does that mean? So I can make a concordant cut, right? If I make a discordant cut, say I do it firm-footed, I'm still powering that mandrito with my right hip, but my left foot is forward. Okay, so you notice I'm still driving that right hip forward as I make that mandrito. Okay? You'll notice that my right or my forward foot now will slightly turn out to accommodate that rotation of the hips. Conversely, if I make a reversal stepping with the right, I'm still powering it with my left hip, even though my right foot is forward. And we did this to begin with. Okay? So we can call these cuts discord. Okay? I'm setting the opposite foot from whence my cut originates. Okay? So you don't need to think about, oh, which foot should I step with? Which side should I cut from? Any cut I make is powered by rotating the body in the same direction. Okay? Whether that be a true edge cut, a false edge cut, or what happens. Okay? So I can make a false manco, right? Still powered with the left hip. Okay? It originates from that left hand side. I'm rotating my body in the direction the cut is going. Okay? Alright. So now, yep, I see a couple of you trying to mimic this, trying to cast the hand. Don't. Okay? In fact, I want you to forget about your hand. Take your heel, kick it out. Don't even don't even move the sword. See how the sword starts moving across? The right side of your body. Okay. Now, just lift your arm. Turn the heel and let it drop. Lift the arm. And back. Okay. Sort of doing this with the false okay. edge, so the back is sort of. So, don't. One of the problems that people make is they feel like they've got to always engage the wrist to do something, so they want to start casting the sword. Mm -hmm. All right. Besides the fact that you're actually going to disarm yourself. Okay, it'll be really embarrassing when you take a powerful blow. Everyone's done some dagger disarms. Okay, you know, right? How to do a simple triangle disarm? How do you do it? You go where there's no thumb. When you're doing this motion. You're working on disarming yourself. Do it again, And stabbing yourself in the groin. <laughs> okay, so that's three flavors of embarrassing. Okay, <laughs> so just power with the hip. And just extend the arm. Now Rob's welcome to hit it. Okay, you can go ahead and cut into it. 
for the going, right? I didn't really use any force, I just turned my body. Okay, so please resist the wrist flourish. It gains you nothing, but it destroys what makes the art effective. Okay? And it is the most natural thing to want to do. So again, when you're thinking about making blows and powering it, your arms and shoulder girdle are nothing more than a steering wheel. They are not the gas, they are not the brake. Okay? Power and control is all coming from your core, mostly from your hips, driven by how you pivot on your feet. Okay? That's crucial. So exploring this idea of turning the body to not only support the ending guard we find ourselves in, but to power the cut itself, let's apply these to the solo form that you guys have been practicing. Okay, I'll take this way. So I'll just do Dago Gia solo form once. Soto braccio, reverse 
reverso tondo, reverso squambrato. So we made a discordant cut, right? I cut from my left, I stepped with my right, driving my left hip forward, right? Every time I make a cut from that left, I'm powering it with that left hip. Quota longa estretta. Okay? And one more time. Soto vacio, reach, reverso tondo, reverso squambrato. Now from here, I'm going to make a falso dritto, okay? A false edge cut originating from my right hand side. So this is a cut from the right. I'm going to power with my right hip. So I drive that right hip forward. Notice what it does to my left hip, okay? Bring the cut around from my left over to the right hand side. Now I make a mandrito, passing with the left into King Gialli. Okay? So just watch me for now. So coda longa, as I make that false dritto, I'm powering with my right hip, notice where my left foot is going, and I cut, my left foot is already going in the direction that it needs to be to form king yali from the curve. Okay? So I've got everybody to start from coda longa, false dritto, driving that right side forward, and my right side is going to end all the way forward by the time I get to king yali for the Back to Cota Longa. Falso Drito and Trito Squalombrato to King Gialli for Tudi Ferro. I'll do it facing this way. Cota Longa, Falso Drito, and Trito Squalombrato. Pass that, Cota Longa. Falso Drito and Trito Squalombrato. From the very beginning, sotto bacio, weight on the left foot. Right heel slightly raised, reach over, grab, reverso tondo, reverso squalombrato. Falso dritto, dritto squalombrato, king gialli porta di ferro. So your palm should be turned to the left, your right hand should be over your left knee. Okay, figuring out where you end up. Two any, edge points to the left. Any comments, questions, concerns about these two segments so far? Your uh, false Rico? Yes. It looks like it's going very far. Yeah. It doesn't go very far. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. just, it's not an attack, it's a clearing motion. Yeah. Parry. In this instance, the half falsy from these middle guards, strata guards, this is where people want to start to drop the hand and create a preparation. Again, the problem is, if I do that, as I drop my hand, I die. Whereas now, as he attacks, so it's it's a weird thing. I'm just lifting. Yes, you are lifting. Okay. Verb specifically in Italian, the body. Lift. Okay. And because this is a very weak action, if done just from the arm, that's why again we're using that. Core to power this. Okay, you'll notice too as Greg. Sure. If I do not turn my body in profile and I make this action, right? I just do it in complete, complete from the arm. Give me a mandrito. Keep going. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't do anything. Okay. I need to turn my body in profile as I do that. Okay. I'm hiding my left side behind my right. Double it explicitly tells us to do this, okay? as I deliver that false sodrito. So not only is it powering the cut, but it's hiding my left side behind my right. Okay? So now when he does that, and deliver right hand cut. Okay. okay, so it's coming across the body. Okay? And Dalgote gives us one other thing that we can uh, do to help protect the body, but we're not doing that quite yet. Okay? He says, turn the outside flat in and almost do it with the church, but we'll get there. <laughs> okay, but for now, just think about turning the body in profile to power that cut and also hide the left side behind the right. Does that make sense, everybody? That will also put our body in the appropriate position, pass and come to King Yali. Okay, so back at the beginning. Soto braccio, weight back, reach over, reverso tono, reverso squam rata. Good. Falso dritto, King Yali for King first. One more time, then we'll add the next action. 
Sotto braccio. Reverse the tondo, reverse the squambrato. Falso dritto. Dritto squambrato. King Yale Porto di Ferro. So we should all be in King Yale Porto di Ferro. So the hand turned in. True edge off to our left hand side. Now, Dalgote is fixing Stramazzone in with the solo drill. Now, when to remember when to do the Stramazzone? Whenever our left foot is forward, is our cue to make that Stramazzone. Okay? So, from King Gialli Porti di Ferro, we're going to make our first Stramazzone, which is a Giorgio Stramazzone, meaning that it breaks to our inside. We pass forward into Porti di Ferro Estretto. Yeah. Good. Nice guys. From his own, you're looking progressively better. Good. So from King Gialli, just pass back, right back to King Gialli. Pass forward, Drito Stramazzone, into Porto de Ferro Stretto. You'll notice that all the cuts we're making are half cuts. I think was the point still directed at our opponent. Right? So from the beginning. Sotero Braccio. Reach. Reverse the tondo, reverse the squan brato. Falso dritto, dritto squan brato. Fast forward, strong and Okay. So I'm in Porto di Ferro, that means my right hip is driving that body forward. Okay. One more time, we'll have the next action. Reach, cut, and cut. Falso and cut. Okay. All right, so ready for the next action? Okay, so from Forte di Ferro Stretta, now I'm going to make a falso manco. Okay, just as we were practicing five minutes ago with Craig. Now pass forward and reverso squambrato into Cotolonga e Alta or Cotolonga e Stretta with the left foot forward. Okay, some masters go back and forth as to what to call this card. We'll keep it simple for today and just call it left foot forward or close to the other stretch. Cut along. Cut along. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's not simple. We'll make it confusing. <laughs> 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 Good. All right. So let's come back to King Yale. Okay. So left foot forward, right side forward. We're making our Charmazzone. Porta di Ferro. Balso Manco. Right? Where am I turning my hips? Let's say cut from the left, so I'm driving that left hip forward. That's appropriate because the next cut I'm making is a reversal squambrato to cota longa stretta, left foot forward, or non dominant foot forward. I have a lot of lefties in my class, so I used to say non dominant and dominant. <laughs> yeah, so I'm looking at it too. Yeah, there you go. Good. All right, let's do it from the beginning. Reset. And once we're done with this, we'll take a break. Okay? So, Sotto braccio, cut and cut. Falso and cut. Stramazzone. Falso and cut. Good. And rest. Okay. So you'll notice that I made. So where did this cut originate? From my left side, right? It's still a reverso, even though it's a redopio, it's still a reverso, which means I'm driving that left hip forward. Okay? So here I am in alley corner. Now, depending on the situation, sometimes alley corner can be with the left hip forward and the hand low, or it can be with the right foot forward, or I'm sorry, the right hip forward. Okay? Depending on the action that we are going to do out of that guard. Alright, one more time. Put a long left foot forward. Reverse the Rodopi, it's Ali Good. Pass back. Reverse the Rodopio. And it's Ali Good. Really? Hold there. Hold the Ali Let your heels and pass the scout slightly. So out a little to your left. Feel what that does to you. You feel how it rotates? Yeah, right here. Yep, now up and out. Feel what happens oh. to the hip? 
Yeah. Okay. What I'd like you guys to do is make shrata with the non dominant foot forward. My left foot is forward. That's my cue to make my shramatsone. Shramatsone. And now I'm going to pass back with the right foot and offline back to King Gyalai. Good. So I'm making two shramatsones in a row there. I'm just going to finish this up so you can see what the rest looks like. I'm make another ribbon cut, falso, and reverso to quote a long shrata, and sheath the sword. Okay? Alright. So separate everybody form Ali Corey. We're gonna make this last in brocada. Firm footed in brocada, recovering point E for our stroke. Good. So now we're gonna make a, another ribbon cut. So that's a false edge followed by a true edge. False manco, driving that left hip forward. Now we're passing back. Okay. Good. Good. Alright, come back to Ali Corno. Firm for de Mercada, or to defer. Falso and reverso. Okay, one more time. Alley corner. And brocada, or to defer. Falso and reverso. Okay. Now from here, Strauman Sonic. Port de Ferro Strata. I'm running you guys into the <laughs> uh, Let's have everybody up here. Everybody come up to the end of the pink mats. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, so Actually, you can do it behind them. That's what we'll see you there. So everybody's in the alley corner. You can watch it from the mirror. Okay, make that four foot even broke out. Four feet for a strike. False and manga, driving the left side forward. And reversal squad rocket passing back. Our non dominant foot forward, that's our cue to make the stramazzoni. Stramazzoni. Good. Back to the first strata. Pass back again into King Galley, making a stramazzoni. So we're in King Galley, Porta di Ferro. So the angle of your step with the right foot should be. Yes, exactly. Okay. Right. So we call King Galley um, a, a wide guard, right? A largo paso, meaning the feet are wide to my opponent. So this gentleman is my opponent, my feet are off the line. So in King Galley, my feet are wide to the line, right? That line being just the straight line between the point of A and the point of B, okay? So my feet are wide in King Galley, of course, the Yes, yeah, so that pass is back and off line. Good. So from here, we're going to make a ribbon cut, right? So that false edge, firm footed. Part of what we need to do is we need to look at how some of the core actions of the old age tradition work. And one of the things that you can't be doing bold sensing without doing is the parry by falso and the rising false edge parry. This is about as core as you can get. And it's also where things can go pretty pear shaped if you don't do it. Okay, so part of what we're going to look at now is the false edge parry. We're going to start sort of low, then we'll put a buckler in hand, we'll show you how the buckler has to integrate with this. Okay. And the easiest way to learn the falsy parry by falso is out of the larger guards because it's one of the things that so that's where we're going to start. Okay, now we're going to start with the falso manco. The falso manco is the falso from the left side and the non dominant side of the body. Okay. See, Alex, it is all about you. That's the one left. Always about me. Okay, now remember, I was giving you some clues about this where I was saying when you frame the guard, the point needs to come out, and that's going to be the first thing, is just the right guard position. So by assuming this guard, what I've done is I've put my sword behind any attack the opponent makes. Okay? So, no matter what his action is, okay? It gives me a reverso, it gives me a thrust. Okay? This makes for a very simple solution, right? When an attack comes, lift your hands. Now, here's where making it that simple a summary can go horribly wrong. Because what you can't do is lift your hand. Right? You will feed his blow straight into you. This has to be a straight arm driven by the body. So now it comes in. How many of you know what guard this is? Defacio. 
Okay, so Guardi de Faccio, okay? Back down. So this is where Macellino continuously gives these, these you know, pieces of advice without going past Guardi de Faccio. Do this, right? What he's trying to tell you is, whichever side it's coming from, don't pull the sword way out of presence. Okay? Um, because it's beyond what you need. So. Now, so what we're going to do to start this is we're going to look at this idea that the foot is down, is tucked in, okay? As you initiate with the hand, you are going to drive out with the heel so that your left hip is pushing forward. The arm should end up straight out from the shoulder, okay? Now, there's two responses I can make. We're going to go with the more bolognese one, which is, as I respond, since I've now front-loaded my right foot, my left foot is going to step out and off the line so that I can make a reversal. Okay. Now, so that's the first part. Okay. I'm cutting Rob's arms. This is not wearing a mask. We were a little bit closer in measure, I could just as easily take this down. Now, the beauty of Polonais school is that it's sort of the school of overkill. So, that's the action. But now you'll notice my foot has started to drift in instead of taking this position here. We're going to look at how I can start to peel myself out okay, at the same time. There's my cut. And this foot steps circularly around me. So what have I done now? I've gained this flank and reoriented my body. Okay. So if I'm just doing a drive-by, boom. Right. If I want to start peeling out and keep my left side forward, I step circularly, and the rear foot follows it around. And you'll notice now I'm important to fairly straight. I mean, put a long thing straight to Alright, now, let's, um, so let's put these together. We'll start with the simple parry and response. You're going to begin firm footed, lift, step out on the 45 into an offline pass, cut with the reverso. Okay? Once you've cut with the reverso, since you're standing right there, just get yourself in the habit. Pass forward with the rest. Okay. Start with that one, then we'll look at it with the trunk and stuff. Okay, so out rob. It looks like this. Parry. Cut. Thrust. Okay, let's try that a couple times. So if you've looked at Morozzo's images, we've got these areas where it looks like the buckler is really contracted, which is the worst way in the world to hold a buckler. Degrassi tells us the buffer's going to be held extended straight off of the shoulder. Okay. But if you look at the guards where it's done, in, as Rob noted, it is usually in guards where I have to refuse the left side of my body. And the reason for that is that if I don't, if I try to square it, okay, this is a very, if you try this, you'll feel a little bit of pull right on the inside of your deltoid, right in the rotator cuff. I have to overreach with my sword because I'm fighting my own body, right? Whereas if I let the heel kick in and the hip pull back, the body's covered just like it is with sword alone. But when I bring the buckler forward, I want you to just look at the difference. If I rotate the hip forward, the buckler appears extended. If I keep the hip back, the buckler looks like it's contracted, doesn't it? Just like Morosa. Okay? It has contracted, but there's nothing behind it, right? The buckler is doing better duty like this than trying to do this where I have to fight my sword. Plus, now, when I start making my ribbon cuts, Not in the way. Okay. So we're going to take a look at. It's much easier to cut around with my buckler. Yeah. So the first.
first thing you need to know about the default position with the buckler is the arm extended. Rob initiates his attack. Nothing's changed so far, right? Now I'm going to step offline and look at what the buckler does. As the cut is made, the buckler moves to the other side of my body. Okay? It doesn't come way down here. That's not what's being threatened. It comes here to close the gap. Okay? Now I step in to kill him, and as I retreat, the buckler is warding the threat of mine. So where does the buckler go? There's a simple rule. Put it where the threat is. Right? This is not useful. The hell am I carrying this thing around for? Right? It's a floating piece of armor. So it needs to float where the threat is. So the threat is there. does is on the initial parry, nothing. As I cut with the step off line, it floats across to fill the gap. Since nature pours a vacuum. As I thrust, you can support it with the sword if you like. Now as you retreat, just make sure that it's back extended from the shoulder. For contrast, we're looking at full longer versus working the barrel and holding the buckler. The images we see are two versus outside, right, over the right arm. So, coda longa, right, our left side is being extended, coda longa. Either I'm just sitting static in guard or I've made a cut from my left, right, driving that left hip forward, which drives the left side forward. This is the fully extended. I make that cut from the right, bringing my right shoulder forward, left hip back, right. My arm is still fully extended. When I rotate that right side forward, this is what we see in the blade. Shoulder is Okay, so you see what we're talking about? Yeah. So don't let the art trick you into thinking that, oh, for some of these guards I do this. Because a buckler, basically held like a rondelle, okay, is useless. Okay? You might as well just be strapped to your chest now. So this is true with all the, the Porta di Ferro guards, whether it be Porta di Ferro Stretta, Kinyali Porta di Ferro, or more also has Porta di Ferro all day as well. Okay? So just remember, Porta di Ferro is standing on the right side. Because we're driving that right forward. Quota longa, the left side is being driven forward. Again, independent of which foot is actually forward. Okay. Make sense to everybody? Excellent. Okay, so one last time with the play. Turn 90 degrees. You guys get the uh, first person shooter view here of it. Step. 
If Rob does decide he wants to try to pick that up with his buckler, for choice. best grappling hand ever, right? Now it can be very percussive like that, or it can be pretty soft. I can open my hand, right? This is what you were asking, okay? Just open my hand, and there's the thrust under the thumb. Okay? Which one's right? Whichever one you need in the moment. Okay. If he's not quite as aggressive with it, his buckler, and he's just trying ways to learn buckler techniques for this part of it is ditch it and figure out how to grapple with your hand. That's what the buckler end do the same thing. Okay. You just have a virtually indestructible dog with that. So here's how we're going to do it for now. I parry. I'm throwing my reverso. He goes to move. Okay. So notice my cut. Right? He blocks that. I should still be protected, but I don't want to find out. Now I've got this tangling up his sword. He's done what his sword can do, right? The most he can do would be to take the left foot and step off to his left, which I don't care about. He cannot possibly do that faster than I can thrust him. Okay? If I really was that worried about it. Clothing. People tend to think that like it's a civilian dueling art. It's not true. It's a martial art for everything. Look at my choices in action here, okay? Let's go back to the beginning. Boom. Cut. There's my thrust into the throat, right? This blow goes after his hand or his arm or his neck. But really, what does it do? It suppresses his arm so that I can thrust him. Option two was what goes up must come down. Again, it's aimed at his face or neck. He goes to hit that, and I get his armpit. Okay. Play three. I'm cutting around, taking control, thrusting up into his throat, face, or armpit. Alternatively, I can thrust into his groin. You know what those spots are? They're all the different spots on his armor. They're all the spots where even with this clothing, there isn't a lot of padding. Padded double isn't padded in the armpit. Okay. He's wearing a nice, he's armed like a good footman from the Italian army. He's wearing a breastplate. He's wearing an open-faced helmet. He may be wearing a male shirt and a gauntlet with long cuffs. It's probably something in that configuration. Tassels for his upper legs. That's great, but that's not where I'm hitting. I'm hitting where all that stuff would not be. Okay? So at the top of class, I mentioned that these Porto di Ferro guards are the defensive guards. And Vigiani explicitly refers to them simply as the defensiva, right? However, in the course of a fight, I will find myself in an offensive guard. I still need to be able to make a defense from an offensive guard, these Cotolonga guards. So there is the converse to the Falso Manco, which is the Falso Drito. However, Dalagokie admits that making a defense from an offensive guard is a little more awkward. So let's look at, back at these defensive positions. Whether it's a rising false edge cut or a descending true edge cut, these reversi are crossing in front of the body. Okay? So I'm remaining protected the entire time because my sword is out in front of the body the entire time. And Vigiani explicitly describes this. However, with the offensive guards, I'm moving back to defend myself. So you can see that if Greg gives me a cut to my inside, I'm in Cotolonga, which is an offensive guard. I need to make a defense from it. If I make this false sodrito, I'm doing nothing really to protect that line. 
So how do I make a defensive action from this offensive guard? Well, Dal Gokie fudges it a bit, and it's a necessary fudge, okay? So first, he says, we'll go real slow, I need to talk about this good, so great. So as Greg delivers this cut, I'm going to begin by bringing my false edge into the engagement. However, by the time I get there, I've rotated my outside flat towards his blade, and I'm going to subtly strike it with the true edge, okay? So you notice that I'm rolling on top of his sword. Now even that, in and of itself, is not going to do the job. So Greg's delivering that cut. Right? That's still going to continue and come in. Okay? So we need to do something else with the body. And in Dalgokie's um, theory section, he says that whenever you make the parry, you're not only defending yourself with the sword, you're defending himself with the body as well. Okay? So I'm not only going to turn my sword and strike it with the true edge, I'm going to rotate my body around, okay? Moving my body away from the incoming attack, okay? So the false omanko is pretty straightforward. Here comes the blow, and I just bring the false edge into an engagement. And that's natural because I'm moving from a defensive guard uncrossing the body. However, from the offensive side, from the Kodlonga guards, I don't have that luxury, so as Greg clip the cut, I come around, stepping away from it, turning my true edge into the engagement to strike it away. And here I am. My response is simply a Drita Squamblato. Now, I think the thing we need to make very clear, especially for anyone who's ever done any fencing before, is that when it's done at tempo, it looks more like doing a simple hang, hanging parry on the true edge, right? So, which people are familiar from back sword, saber, or whatever, so do a true edge hanging parry. Sure. So, let me talk about the subtle difference between a Guardian to test the parry, which is strictly with the true edge, and a false sodrito, as according to Dr. <coughs> so look at where my point is with the false sodrito. Go real slow. It's above his hand, okay? With the Guardi Detesta Prey, strictly with the true edge, my point is below his hand, which is a true hanging parry, okay? So really, Detesta is a hanging version or a cross line version of Guardi de Alicorno. Alicorno, Detesta. Okay, so really I am coming through this detested position with a false Drito. And my response is a Drito Stramanzone. Okay, and that group actually has this in two. One during the Yerusposta and one during the retreat. Okay, now the reason for the difference, one is certainly more secure. It's a very much a firm parry, the detested parry. Right. Brought to stop my sword. Okay. But of course, that gives us a moment in which we can both go looking for a response. With the other, just like when we do the false omako, he just takes my blade and throws it aside. So now I'm busy recovering my sword as he's executing a response to. I'm fine. Okay. So one of them, if you were to make the response from here, would look much more like saber, right? If you wrench the hips and just cut around. This, the sword never stops its motion, so it's continuous, okay? So you see how turning the true edge into it as well sets me up for that Druto Stramazzone, right? So there's another reason why the Falso Mako is preferred over the Falso Drito is also the response. Remember we <laughs> talked about how the thrust is the preferred attack. Well, it's not only the preferred attack as the agent, it's the preferred attack as the one performing the response as the patient. The false sodrito does not allow me to respond with the thrust. There's no way I'm thrusting Greg from this position. I can try to do this, that's super awkward. Uh, and if I need to turn the true edge, I need to make it long tempo and come back to the true edge, which gives Greg plenty of time to do something else. However, with the false of Monko, because I'm making it right into fascia, I can easily respond with the thrust. That's a natural. Okay? So this false sodrito is not a preferred action. But it's an action you must know because during the course of the fight you will find yourself in Kodalonga needing to make a defense. And one of those defenses is a false Drito. Okay. Any questions on the false Drito itself? So instead of trying to engage the blade with the false edge, which has to roll naturally into the true edge, I'm simply going to hit my true edge there first. So here comes the cut. I can do the same stepping away. So I make this parrying guardi di testa. I release the pressure, step to him, Drito Stramazzone and back out, all right? All right, so we did it the hard way first, just so you can see why we're gonna do it the easy way, the better way. 
Any questions on that? And why it's not symmetrical. Yeah, right. So it's Side note, when you have a spadone, a two-handed weapon, it doesn't matter. You can do both as you choose because that extra lever gives you much more power and control from this side. So after we ended the morning session by saying, see, it's all the same, see, it's all the same until the morphology of the weapon changes it. <laughs> okay, make sense? So now we're going to go ahead and look at the coordinated test. Yeah, so this is a peri bimetable So it's not a deflection now, where I'm using the devilet of the sword to deflect my opponent's weapon away. I'm moving in to collect the energy. Okay? And again, as Dalgo DA tells us, our hand moves to intercept, our body moves away to void the line. And that makes it a peri on the forte. Right? So when we collect, we want to take it on the forte of the blade. Yeah. So. Yeah, you can see how this would be a bad idea if I were to try to take this on the doubling. So, back again. I'll carry it the wrong way with the doubling. And obviously I'm pulling my blade low because I thought it would be really rude to hit Robin in the face while I was teaching. <laughs> and you can't see it because his body's framed, but my point is in his grind. So, fortunately he's already had a child. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, I'm done. So, on the other hand, he's driving back with you. <laughs> not anymore, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now instead of using the false edge of the devil, right, we're using the true edge of the forte. It's that the coordinate to test the position, I'll look in the pair as do it, is simply aleatorium with the point pulled over so that it crosses my body, okay? What I see a lot of people doing is making like a true garden pair, okay? So why is this not to test them? Well, remember I said that for attack, for Viscosta, it is a thrust, right? I do not have a thrust out of this position. Uh, yep. Uh, give me a pendente, actually. So if Greg were giving me a pendente, look at where my point is, right? It's very easy for me now to bring in an embrocata. Okay, I've collected them right on my forte. Greg's sword's not going anywhere. It's going exactly where I want to put it which is off to my outside as I'm doing that thrust, okay? If the direction of the blow is more squat right or more diagonal, then I'm simply going to yield to that pressure. I'm not going to try to fight it. Here's my parry, right? Oh, he's going through my dead leg. Fine. There we go. Okay? But I don't want to pigeonhole myself into this position where I only have a cut. All right, we see the English. Here, 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 right? Because that's the only resource that they have as their option, okay? Not the attack. The Italian way, extend the point to him, so when I receive that blow, oh, look at that, it's on my forte, perfect, there we are, okay? So it is alley corner with the point right just outside of my opponent, okay? Here, okay? So with that correction, keep going. And every master has their um, preferred way to parry, which we're not going to be able to get to today, okay? But this is the common parry, this is the easiest, most simple way to defend against an attack coming in, okay? But there's a lot of bad ways to do it, but we can't do those bad things. The thing I, I told some of the groups who were trying to just drop the point in is what you need to think of is, this is a lifting motion to provide, prevent the undercut, okay? So what I'm doing is, remember like before when we were down here, I said the beauty is, no matter what he does, my parry involves lift the hand, okay? It's true here too, okay? So no matter what he does, I'm lifting it, okay? And I'm intentionally not stepping any place. You'll see, especially in the assaulty for Sword and Buckler, you constantly get that phrase, sort of a rise up with the Sword and Buckler into Guardia de Testa, okay? So what I'm doing, like now Rob wants to try to sneak a tondo in. Let's put the tondo in, okay? You see how now it just transmutes into Protolonga Estrata? Because it's going to move through that line. So the only way he could try to really undercut me is if he wanted to swing at my leg, which would be basically suicidal for him, okay? Because he'd then fall under my hand. But that's essentially it. Okay. <laughs> right? All right, I bought it. You've ruined my pants. And you've eaten the thrust. Yeah. You may hurt my leg, too, but... Or Greg gets slip his leg. Yeah, if I know it's coming. Okay? So we have solutions for all of that. But the idea you need to think of is you are lifting into it. And what we'll see is I can lift, moving away, which is what we've been doing here. Or I can lift, moving in. Okay? 
which is what I've made you if I have the buffer or if I want to move it to a grip, which we'll look at in just a minute. Okay? So just try this a couple more minutes. Really think about lifting with your forte. It's the shortest line to his sword. Okay? That's why we're not dropping the point. Okay? Shortest line. So the first thing we need to know is what does the guard look like? And Monchiolino gives us the best description of it, which is basically the sword is set the height of the shoulder, just like before. The buckler is the same thing, except that the sword is just a little bit lower than the shoulder. Okay? So essentially it looks like I'm double blocking myself, right? Sword don't goes in front of the buckler, not back of the buckler. Now, let me mention something about that does not always be true. In principle, in the play, sometimes we are told to cut into the back of our buffler and lift the sword into testa. That usually means I'm making a reinforced block of some sort. Okay? But as a rule, when we're just standing in the guard, the sword is forward, the arm is a little bit lower than the buffer. Why? Because it can't be. Because it can't be. Right? Why is it not as a default behind the buffer? Okay. Now I'm going to trap myself under my own sword, right? This is great for figuring out ways to create strong block to step in on something. It sucks for everything else. Here now my sword's free. Okay? Does so that make sense? All right. So the first thing we're going to do is just a simple parry off of the reverse so Rob is going to feed me the cut. I could step away, put that thrust in. Okay. So notice it's really easy for him to turn that thrust. So if he does, I need something else to do. Now here's where the pass comes in. Here I'm kind of reaching to do stuff. Okay. So watch if I change my step just ever so slightly. And I'm going to move in towards the attack. Coming with my thrust, he wants to put that aside. I get what I want. So I aggress him basically in response to his attack. Okay, and what the hell? We'll make this really obvious to him. Okay, he comes the thrust. He doesn't like that. I push his blade into his own arm. He's looking at this, wondering what I'll do. I don't know what I'll do. So the initial action, all that's changed, is from my invitation in Port of the I'm going to move in, okay, before I didn't test it. I'm going to start passing in the thrust. He's going to respond with the only tool he has. I'm going to drive his sword into his body arm. Thrust. You might as well stay in the retreat in here, a very cold day sort of retreat. Okay? And then as you fly out, according to function. Okay. You know, we look at the senyo, the cutting diagram, and of course the lines are running through the person, and it's easy to think about, like, you know, that's a squalombrado, that's a reverso squalombrado, that's a tondo, that's a reverso tondo, right? But of course, all these blows exist any place they need to be, okay? So sure, that's a Madrido squalombrado. That could be two. That could be two, right? If that's the angle of the cut, that's a Madrido Squalombrado. That's the target. Okay? So, really, if we think about the four quarters of the body in fencing, the eight cuts exist in all of those quarters. All right? And that's something that's important to remember. And so, we're going to talk about that a little bit right now. Okay? We're going to get a very slight variation of what we're doing. Simply because the idea here is if I'm in Porta de Ferro Stretta, Rob is throwing me a reverso. This is a really easy parry for me to make, right? Very easy parry for me to make. So what if, think about, remember, what goes up must go down, okay? So what if he tries to just slip a mandrito inside my sword? Doesn't matter, okay? Same thing. Now the beauty of this is that when I step in, because I am going to step in, this happens in one tempo, okay? So if we were doing this unarmed, this would be a check, right? Or push. The buckler doesn't care about that. I'm just going to break his elbow, okay? Unless he's covered it with his buckler. Go ahead. Okay. 
I'm going to make and eat that crust. Okay? For some reason, I feel I'm feeling merciful. I'll cripple them instead. Okay? I recommend making and feel the thrust. Okay? <laughs> Understood? But you got make and feel the thrust, then cripple them. So you can fly out if you can't follow. You'll notice all of a sudden we're cutting at the low leg. That's the beauty of having a shield. I can. The buckler itself, by the way, never protects below the knee. Okay? Its defense ends at the knee. If I need to defend with below there, I need to develop space, or I have to defend with the sword. Okay? Understood? So from Porta de Ferro Strata, he decides I can even, he can even just try to do a quick slip off the line and cut me by Mesovolta. Yeah, I didn't say I was making my first choice. I'm just saying he could. But now the buckler, remember that mesovolt of the body, I'm driving into him to check him. Okay. So, not elegant, except in his brutality. Okay? So, or he can make the beat. to make a mesable, right? I'm making a mesable here. The difference here is that in both cases, when he attacks, right, I'm moving in to cover him, okay? Stepping out, right, I'm bringing him out of this long, sweeping, pretty, very Aikido-esque armbar, okay? Moving in, okay? I'm moving him in a very nice Armazari sort of armbar. This is what we're doing in this play, okay? We're doing an arm bar. We just happen to have a sort of buckler in our hand. And I don't need to finish the lock because I'm just going to run a sword through his head instead. Okay? But so the same idea. He wants to attack. I'm moving in to take control of it. I'm stepping circularly and applying my buckler to his elbow. Okay? I don't need to work, waste any time with the rest of this crap. I'm going to shove a sword through his skull. Make sense? But you see the circular footwork here as opposed to up here. I was moving out here, right? I can't do that. I have to do a pull down, right? So sometimes just ditch the swords and look at what happens when you move your feet. Because your body's your body's your body, okay? And it's an interrelated art anyway. So here, as you make this cover, boom, okay? I'm in, right? There's my Guardia di Testa. Step circularly and keep coming in, it's just that now, that's what's happening as I do it. It's called a long base strata, either left foot forward or right foot forward, okay? Now, right here we're going to see why this, these versions of either using the falso drito or using where to test it to the inside is really necessary to smoke it. Because a lot of that real estate is already covered by the buffer itself. So Rob brings a cut in, right? take much to stop it with the bottle. Okay? Now, the only problem is, it doesn't take much, but if he does change the line of his cut at all, the odds are you can see the bottle. This is small. Okay? This is another reason for we have the Brocaro Largo case, the large buckler. From the side. Another reason why it hurts combat is probably based on this, because now, right, okay, not deceiving much of anything except itself, okay, so it shuts out a lot of things. When I get to the Rotella, I can just pretty much ignore 25% of my target area, okay, what do I do with it? I'm doing it, okay, so that's something I understand, but we don't have that. Don't have that. So, so yes, the buckler can ward it, but it does. Don't think of it as the buckler as a built-in automatic defense. Okay. Instead, think of it as the buckler makes it harder for him to get the cut in, which starts to force him to play to the other side of my body, and 
it makes my next defense easier. I'm going to take the buffer away for a moment. Okay? So we're going to have a new piece of footwork in route 10, so we're not going to do that. Okay? Initially. That's what I need to step with. Okay? So you'll notice he's taking himself off the line a little bit. So trying to make a simple meso volta okay, isn't going to get the job done very easily. There's a good chance he'll be able to literally wrap the right around that sword. Okay. So that sucks. So I need something more. So I need to move my feet. So I'm going to make a cross line step. It's the first one we've looked at. So remember our triangle step we've been looking at? Now what we're going to do is sort of its exact opposite going forward. We're going to step off the line with the front foot, and then we're going to make a mezzavolta of the back foot forward. Okay? Forward. Pardon me, Jacob. Okay. So, now the best thing I can do is step into this and give him something to look at. Okay? You'll notice it's actually in his throat at the moment. That's why he put the mask down. Anybody know the name of this card? Yes. Guardia de Faccia. Contrary is with the hand turned the other way. Okay. So Guardia de Faccia, it's palm up. Now, people tend to think of this that Guardia de Faccia is a counterattack. That's not necessarily true. Okay. okay. It needs to come up to cover him. If it happens to stick him through the head, yay. Now, I'm going to make that visible to going forward, and I'm going to turn my palm over his arm. Okay, do a 180. Okay. Okay. So, again, a step towards his right side. I just thrust my sword at his attack. It's caught on my cross here. Could get caught up on the up on the uh, hot arms. Doesn't matter. Face to put a longa, right? Could be here, could be here. Notice where the point is. Right where the dip of the mask doesn't help. Please note that fact. Okay? So, now we'll pay attention to my hand over his sword. Okay? Over, over his sword, over his sword wrist. So, one last time now, I'll add a step. You see how close that makes us? That's pretty good. Okay. Let's do it without the buckler, and I'll show you the bonus the buckler is. Okay? Or this collection in the facha is that it is the way to get someone's outside to do most of the grapples. The sword of one hand, the preze. Okay? The Bolognese don't grapple as much as, say, Fiore Libri does in the earlier period. They don't grapple as much as you see with German Messer fighting. But they do grapple. They do grapple and they have more than enough of it to get the job done. Bob is not facing his head with the mask that actually fits his skull. Okay? So we're not going to do a bunch of grapples here, but I'm going to show you what they would be so that when we substitute the buckler, you'll understand what the buckler's doing. And also so that we can talk about this is a really cool, fun parry, right? <laughs> it has, it does have a problem to it, like everything. Okay. So Rob gives me the attack. I move in, right? So we saw this simple action here. Okay. I can just as easily use this to command his elbow. Yeah, cool. Okay. We <laughs> don't hear about one Yeah. Okay. So that's the easiest one. It's just to command and control his elbow. Right. Maybe I don't want to kill him. I could also use it to set up a throw. Okay. I can use it to set up almost anything in between, including one of my favorites. Okay, That, by the way, is supposed to be with the guard into his throw. I'm just using it to make a hook and take him over my hip. Okay, so those are a few examples of the grips that we have. And then the simplest, the simplest that you really can't do swordsmanship without having. Right? 
which is up, up, and away. Okay? I wonder which way it'll turn around. Sorry. Okay. So, that's one of the other things that this is used for, is to make grips. The buckler is going to substitute this by doing one very simple action. As it comes around, it's going to give his elbow some love. There's my thrust, there's my cut, there's my fall so to the wrist as I fly out. Right? So all it does is again take up two for one. Okay? Now there's another reason this is important to We put the buffers behind ourselves for a moment. I said this particular collection in Facha is beautiful, it's elegant, it's powerful. It also brings in a lesson about the notion of Joko Stretto or close point. As I move here, Rob and I for one moment have parity. That means what one guy can do, the other guy can do. Right? Mm -hmm. In addition, even the simplest way to do this is as I start to hook over his wrist, he can hook his palm all over my wrist. Right? And just pulls down and cuts me. Okay? So the problem is there is this moment of parity here, which is why, of course, the ideal solution for Guardian Pacha is to go right after his face. And while he's thinking about that, I'm doing a bunch of other stuff here. Okay? But let's just assume that we've come through the vine, I have not stuck him through the face, and we are coming in here. Now what the buckler does is it allows me to make sure that his arm can't get control of mine. Okay, understood. So it makes this transfer motion. There's my thrust. Okay. Now, that brings me to the last thing I want to mention about Guardian Fasha before we do this technique. The other big thing Guardian Pacha is used for is to retreat out of distance. And it's always used the same way, which is you thrust into Guardian Pacha with the buckler over the sword. Okay? So let's see where we would put that in. Okay. This can also be used as a provocation just by going forward. Okay. Essentially, I make him do the same play to me. Right? I make him do the same play of Guardian de Faccia picking up his sword, but he didn't do anything. So I had to be the attacker, the defender, and the winner all along. Okay? We'll look at that in, in a few minutes of provocations. Mm -hmm. Not just provocations. But so for now, here's how I'd like you to put the retreat in. Okay? In text, move into Guardian de Faccia. Now let's come over to the top. I push his elbow. I give him a thrust. Right? Closing the line here, towards the fairway strata, I pass back into Faccia, back into port to the fairway strata. Okay, done without Rob. One, two, okay, three, four. Make sense? We're still drawing that V in our forward. Okay, let's try it out. Get around the help. In exactly the way that a real one won't. But so as I go to Guardi de Faccia, I can do this all in one tempo. Okay? So I'm literally corkscrewing the sword through Rob. Okay? Like making a little C cut in him. So. Boom. There's my thrust. Step back is part of what makes sure it doesn't get stuck in him. Okay. So it saves you a tempo to not go thrust, recoil, step out. It's thrust, twist, step out. Okay, see the difference? You guys are doing it right. Okay. Um, but uh, everybody else was doing the two tempos that didn't specify. So now try it this way, you'll see how much quicker it is. Also, even with these nice flexible swords, your partner will feel that. 
it's not the best feeling in the world. Sometimes that's good. Okay? So, especially those of you with the, uh, the wasters down there, you'll definitely feel it. Okay. King Giale Portofero Strata. And then we have two larger cards. Portofero Largo. Larga. Right. We have all the corner, but we're only using it as something we're transitioning to. That's going to be true with two other guards that we've been using, which are two cells. So really, our fighting guards, our guards that come to the approach for today, is just five positions. One, two, three, four, five. Okay? From there, we now establish a really simple rules for covering ourselves. Okay? If I am low, my point is low, I'm going to defend myself with a false edge deflection. That's has to be tested. Function. Do that all day. If it's low to the other side, I'm going to use this much scarier false edge parry. Or better yet, I'm just going to go ahead and use it to guard and test. But here's the cool thing: once we get the buffer in there, we can virtually throw those away altogether. Okay? We don't have to worry about them at all. Instead, now as we move to the middle guards, the strata guards, it becomes really simple. If I am in Porta de Ferro Estreta and Rob gives me an attack, he can only attack to my right. I'm going to cover in Guardia de Testa and respond with the thrust. Right? Conversely, if I am in Cola Longa Estreta and Rob gives me an attack, I'm going to cross step, go into Guardia de Faccia and respond with the cut for thrust. Okay? The buckler's job is to just fill the back, right? To make sure that my sword arm stays safe and to make sure that I can take control of his arm if I need it. So all this without, with just the sword becomes, right? One possible flipper. Okay. That's the true edge version. We have a system in mind for a right there. There's a lot more you can do with sort of buffer. That's the basis. Now, the buffer is the floating piece of armor in general. It shuts down a line and forces it to cut around it. It is a weapon I transfer to. Okay? The sword is the active item. Can the buffer, if he's just stupid enough to cut straight at my temple here, can I just use the buffer? If I'm fighting from a guard like this and he cuts to my other side, can I just use the buffer? Yes. But notice my cut is quickly getting there. The sword is the active item. This is true of sword of buffer, it's true of sword of dagger, okay? This is essentially true of sword of cloak, a little bit different. Okay. Sword of rotella, you have a shield that you cannot displace with a sword. So sword of rotella is kind of like the lazy man's sword to show. Yeah. It's, I'm just going to shut down 25% of all my targets. Oh look, now I shut down 50%. Let's go. <laughs> okay. Um, so it does lots of work by simple existence. Okay. Um, but basically, the sword is the active agent, and the buffer is a transfer agent. If you 
think of the buckler as what you do sword alone with Prese, but better. Still understand that he's the buckler. Okay? And so then we look at a couple ways that we can retreat. Right? I can retreat by throwing it off on Tante. I can retreat by making a ribbon cut. I can retreat by going to Guardia de Fonte. What we have not done is we have not figured out how the bloody hell do I attack? All this is required, they come to me. Okay. So how we attack is going to be a constant call complications. And that's what we're going to spend about the next 45 minutes on. I'll show you what's an actual All right, so as Greg alluded to, uh, before we grow, he said there's something vitally missing from our fight so far. And as Greg mentioned, it's these provocations. Every single master talks about tempo in their own unique way. But Dalagoke really gets at the heart of why we're not attacking what call out of tempo. If Greg and I are offensive, and he's formed a guard, right? All right, in this case, Portuguese Ferris shreds up. I know I can attack to the inside. That's where his blade is. He shouldn't attack right into his blade. That doesn't do me any good. Now when I look at this, I see that open side. I see that he's open to the outside. So if I attack there, all Greg has to do is make the fight messable. So, I say, Man. so what do I do? Okay? I need to provoke him out of the guard that he's in. Okay? When he's at rest, he's not making a tempo. Right? This goes back to Aristotle. Through motion, we recognize time, the passage of time. And that's why we call motion intensive, the tempo. Okay? So I need to get Greg to move out of that guard. Okay? Now I can do that in two main categories. One, entice him to attack me, because if he attacks, he's leaving the safety of his guard. Right? Okay? Or I can get him to defend one quadrant and then attack another quadrant. Right? That would be a thing. Okay? So I can either provoke by making a guard change, or a position that entices my opponent to strike, or I can provoke by giving him attack, which forces him to move to Perry's head and go somewhere else. Okay? So let's go right back to the beginning where we started with these false such questions. Why is Greg attacking me? Okay? One possible reason why Greg is attacking me, because I've given him a nice juicy target to attack to. Okay, so here we are, Greg's in Corte Fara Shreta, I'm in Cota Longa Shreta, and I simply do this. Whoa, Greg sees that nice juicy opening and he goes for it. I drew him out of his guard. That's exactly what I wanted Greg to do. Okay? Now he might see this. He might be the type of person, maybe he's a little smarter. And he sees me do this, and he doesn't go for it. Okay? So what can I do to make it even more enticing? Let's say I start back here. Oh man, look at that crappy attack. And then Greg goes right in. Okay? <laughs> and because the measure was wide, he's getting me to take an attack on pass. The longest attack I can make. Therefore, what? The slowest. Okay. Which gives Rob lots of time to see what I'm developing. So, whereas this is a provocation, right? I'm presenting Greg an opening in this tempo, he might not go for it. Okay? That's a pretty small tempo and it's a pretty short action, right? So, I can give him a longer tempo. Come in, give him that mandrito, cut in front of him, cut right back down to court. Very large to draw that attack. I moved him out of guard. What do I know to do from here? A false amount. So I'm drawing him out of that guard in order for me to parry in this close. Okay? So, what does that look like? And there we go. Okay? So, why did Greg get that? Going back to the very beginning, we just said attack him. But why is Greg attacking now? Because I provoked him to do so. Okay? I told him exactly when. And where I want him to attack without him knowing it. Does that make sense? So, the way to think about it, a provocation, is that we talk about initiative in all martial arts, right? I'm going to attack first because Rob has tricked me into believing I have the initiative. But I really don't. Because if you think about it, I'm following a script that he gave me that ends with my death. And I'm on board with this. Okay? So, really, I'm a puppet. And so, that's the idea here is he's got to give me a convincing story for me to buy into. Okay? So, so you want to have start with this one? Yeah, so let's just start with this. So instead of just forming the static guard and now our opponent attacks, 
Okay? We're going to actually give them a good reason to attack. We're going to give them a tempo. I'm giving my opponent a tempo in action, in motion, in order to draw a tempo from them. Okay? Do we understand that? Okay. So that action I'm giving is just a creative way to get to Fortune Deferred Larga. Because I know exactly what I can do from Fortune Deferred Larga. If I move into a position and I do something like this, and then I forget what I can do from here, I didn't provoke it, right? I didn't sell my story because I don't even know what my story is. Okay? So when I provoke my opponent, I'm moving into a position that I immediately know what I, all, all chains of branches of techniques I can do from that. And I don't need to think too hard because I have one action that takes care of anything Greg will do. False Amanka. He trusts. False Amanka. He doesn't have any judo. False Amanka. He's a reversal. False Amanka. That's the benefit of forming these guards on either side. If I form my guard in the middle, so let's say I was in Alta and I do something like this, I don't know which side Greg's going to. He can go to either side. Okay? I want to limit his possibilities by giving him one avenue, which is over my arm to my outside. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? So you'll notice he's coming into one of those defensive guards, right, on the left side of the body, because it's easiest to defend from. Yeah. And it makes sense because on attack, we usually end on in a defensive guard. So it doesn't look suspicious to me. Okay. Why, why should the opponent fall for that? He doesn't have to. I don't have to. But then I can move to the next provocation. And so here's the thing. So if he doesn't, right, he may do that. That's how I fell for it. I closed the line. I said, no, nah, I think that's bullshit. And he says, okay. How about that? Because now you let me get close enough that I can actually hit your blade. That isn't bullshit. He struck my sword. I now must do something. He didn't, he didn't move on his own, so I physically made him move. Okay, and that is one of the things now. So the first provocation is just to get in. And I can't just call BS on it because he is cutting. Remember, he's not just dropping his sword. Watch when he makes the first action. He's throwing a cut at me. He's just intending for it to fall short. I start moving in, I'm going to eat this thing. That could have easily been an attack to his head. I yeah. stepped short and I pulled my cut. Okay? That could have easily been this. Right? So, so when I realize he's pulling short, if I decide to hold that guard, okay, but look at how tempting it's so close. <laughs> <laughs> okay? It's like a big lollipop or something. So, um, so here's the other thing about the provocation. When you practice this, you don't want to practice it like this. Rob gives me the cut. Ah, there he is, and I attack. When do I want to launch my attack? As his sword goes, as his sword goes by, right? So, and that's part of why he's pulling himself short, so that he's going to get some time to make this work. Yeah, I can't be overextended. See the difference there? So as his blade goes by, I go, you idiot. Oh, I'm the idiot. <laughs> okay, does that make sense? But having said that, you're right, huh? If you don't buy it, you don't do it. You just go, no, no, no. Nice try. Okay, make sense? So let's try this very first. You're going to come in a measure, throw a cut. They're going to be important to Pharaoh Strata. As soon as the cut goes by, pass forward with the left and thrust. Defend by false manco and do any of the responses that we taught. Okay. All right, so Greg's going to give me that provocation. Okay. Yep. So, think about how to make it easy. Sure. All right, so I see that big juicy opening, right? And I know that's my tempo to respond. I'm going to attack Greg. However, he's going to put the deeper larger. All right. What is his defense? I know this, sir. False He's going to make a false amanco. So I know if I attack, even if it's in tempo, he's still moving to make that false amanco. So I'm going to make a provocation of my own, and I'm making a provocation by attack or pain. Okay? So I'm going to provoke into the invitation that he's giving me. And watch, uh, watch my uh, feet and the way I move the arm as it is. So I'm going to go to gives me the provocation. I extend. There's this false amanco, and I'm in. Okay? So look at what I did. When we look at the approach, especially with single sword, um, the sword and buckle, we see a lot more passive, but the single sword this is a preference to keep the right side forward. Why? Because my sword, which is also my shield, is attached to the right side of my body, so I want to keep that side forward. Okay? So the way I'm going to approach Greg is I'm going to give him a feint 
in tempo of its cut and in tempo of the gathers of her foot. I'm going to avoid this Terry, maybe the truth of Charmantone. And as his blade's going this way for the Terry, I'm going to tap him to the opposite side. So he didn't provoke me, I provoked him. I made him Terry. Okay? He thought he had the initiative on me by forcing me to attack. So I showed him that attack. He wants me to attack, right? That's the whole purpose of cutting down here, to get him strong out of the guard so I can carry it to respond. Okay? However, my provocation, which is a faint in this case, because it's a provocation by attack. There we go. I avoid it. I fall. And I made the trickle show and so on. Avoiding this blade altogether. Okay? Uh, the Johnny shows this, you don't have to do this. Here, here, here. So you know, we be here, right? And then I finish the thing. Draw into his arm, crush it, and back out. Okay? So we'll do this sort of one first, and then we'll do the sort of one. Any questions? Okay? Ready? Okay. Because otherwise, he's taking energy out of this, and now I have to redirect my cut. I want to redirect it wherever I want, my own choosing. And I want to carry it to go wide. So that's why when we're putting this thrust in, okay, as he gives me the cut, okay, I'm letting him move past. So why don't we build an even smarter route? He was thinking a couple layers deep. And he thinks, okay, so I get this great universal parry by Falso. Problem is, it's a huge motion, it's a full cut, it means it takes a full tempo, it means he can counter and mezzo tempo. So, why don't I throw a half cut instead? So I'm in Porta de Ferro Estreta. Rob provokes me by going to Porta de Ferro Estreta. Okay? Now, when I go to make my feint, what's his covering action? He can do it by false edge, or since we haven't covered the false edge from there, right? He can do it by going to Guardia di Testa. Okay? Now, the problem with Guardia di Testa, of course, is that it is constantly moving towards my sword. So if I try to just very quickly get the feint in there, bring her back, boom, it's much harder for me to get free, isn't it? So instead, as soon as I make my feint, of course, the other option is as he turns to Guardian Testa, he can make it even worse on me by stepping into my sword or stepping out with his left foot, which is where I need to free my blade to cut around. Everybody with me so far? So, okay. Okay. He starts to step with his left foot as I'm freeing my sword to cut around. Suddenly, this isn't freeing my sword to cut around anymore, is it? It's a parry. Okay? We're in a bind. Okay? Problem is, I still need to disengage my blade. So now let's see if Rob can make this, he can take control of the fight from me here. By using Guardian to test up, either stepping in with his right foot or stepping with his left. Okay? Let's see what he comes up. Oh, that's kind of embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> he actually doesn't have to do anything. He just drops his point when I go to free my sword, which means that I can't what? Free my sword. So if I'm on autopilot, faint. And what guard is that? According to Facha. He holds the center line all the way throughout. Kind of embarrassing, isn't it? My beautiful plan just ended horribly. Okay, with a lot of data work. All right, so here's what we're going to try. You're going to faint going to Porta de Ferro Estreta. Okay? You are going to go ahead and provoke them with a faint of your own. As soon as they go to get the blade, right? hopefully you can still get them free of it. You're going to start to cut around. You're going to eat it. Right? You'll notice that I switch, switch, foot, I step with. It all depends on where my weight is at that moment. I'm going to step with the foot that doesn't have to wait down. Okay? okay. I should be able to form the exact same guard independent of which step I'm, which foot I'm stepping with, right? Back to our very first lesson of the day. Let me tell you, I feel profoundly dead right now. Since I can feel my pulse against the rubber block on this sword. Okay? So, one last time. Right? You can see where that takes us. Very sad, Greg. Okay. Make sense? Let's try it out. It's very home today, guys. Okay.
see how people walk into this because I could I could teach this to you in Spanish terminology, right? Basically, I come on guard, fingernails up. Rob provokes me, lowers, ends up with this point down, fingernails up, right? I thrust, fingernails up. I move to a position, fingernails down, right? I attempt to cut, fingernails down, thrust me to the face, fingernails up. Okay? Now the reason I'm sticking that in there, besides the show that I said at the beginning, how similar the Mediterranean styles are from this period, is that you can get lost in bowl based terminology. That's the only thing. There's a lot of terminology you can get lost in. But once we start to get to the spot of the philo, looking at these things, it really is just about as simple as fingernails up and fingernails down. How do I figure out how high? What part of the sword am I sticking them with? Where? Okay. So sometimes if you need to cheat and really reduce it, just to understand where it is, you know where your body is, you know where your fingers are. Do that. Okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Just make sure you don't learn what you're talking about. Too. You know, so the same. So, I mean, um, <laughs> so okay. So now let's take a look at how this how this style how this would work with the buffer. Okay. So here we are. I'm waiting for Rob to come and get me. First of all, Rob would feel a lot more comfortable making that full cut. Can he? So he can sure. Okay. But realistically, sure he can. So here it comes. Right. He's going to pick that up. Now instead of doing all that other stuff, I may just decide it's time to take two for one because the buffer lets me do that. There's my thrust. There's my cut, there's my retreat, okay, or there's my retreat, okay? So it may become a completely different play, but we can play along, okay? So let's go with the smarter Rob, he's going to be much more cautious, okay? And I execute my feint, he covers in Guardia de Testa. I move to strike the round, oh, look at that, Guardia de Testa is not an automatic box. So it could change things, right? Or So, what's his defense going to be? 
But to Volta? What guard is he going to go to? Guardia di Testa. Guardia di Testa, exactly. So he's going to move to Guardia di Testa. Okay? So. Oh. <laughs> and his response there, if he were to get there, would be there, right? Okay? We've done this action as well. However, it's my play, so I get to win. Okay? So I've anticipated this. Which is why I made a provocation by feint with the thrust. Guess what the reverso is? It's a second feint. Okay? So, thrust. Feint. Okay? So now the buckler was here, right? Boom. He gets to eat it on his leg with a little step to the right. Okay? There's the earnest attack. Boom, doesn't need that knee. Now I need to withdraw. I'm going to pull this back to be safe. Okay, so there's the retreat under Guardia de Faccia. So I'm going to put it all together. And you'll notice, whether he responds or not, I make that motion clear to cut. I'm not going to wait to see. Part of what I've been trying to do is prune his decision tree. So there's only one logical decision at a time. If he parries a guardian to testa, there's only one logical decision. He's going to drop his point. Or he's going to throw a mandrito or transfer with the buckler. Right now that sounds like it's three things, but it's not. Two of them require him to drop the sword on the same line. They're covered the same way. The other one requires him to make a tempo to transfer to the buckler, which I can feel. Okay? Either way, I can de deal with all of these issues by doing the same thing, which is making that same transition he was thinking about himself. Right? And because his buckler's high, his most logical thing is to worry about his head. So I hit him with the leg. And that gives me that thrust to retreat under, which may kill him. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay? Mm -hmm. Alright, so one last time without Rob and I saying anything. haven't done in the workshop, right? We used all the guards you've seen. We used a simple straight thrust. You've done that. We made a cut by Stramazzoni with a step off line. We've done that. We cut around the head over here. You've done that. We used simple provocations by face. You've done that. And we used a buckler press. We did that. Oh, and a cover by Guardia de Testa. All of those were actions that we already did in this workshop. And you can put it together, mix and match, you can use historical plays from the spot of the philo section without needing much more. Okay? All right. So, um, just a last couple of comments. Besides just the thank you, you guys were a real pleasure to teach. 